programme this week, we're going to be talking a fair bit about insurance because it's an interesting subject that everybody tries to avoid, but it is very, very necessary. We look at some of the programmes that you can get, but also how it really works. This week people are talking about the drought and even though we've had a bit of rain it still hangs in there which is very concerning for people, especially on the dry land. New York, what's going to happen? There's been explosions over there and the top politicians are going over there and if they do survive, what are they be talking about? Wall prices, there's a bit of a question mark over those at the moment. It's interesting that the Rangiora a &P show is 150 years old this year. To celebrate, they're going to be doing a royal event for three or four of their sections and they're also going to be celebrating over three days rather than two so we've got horses on friday amp show proper on saturday and then celebrations on the sunday and speaking of irrigation with some schemes being already having a hundred percent restriction on them the question mark is still hanging very large over the ruatanifa scheme lawyers are making hay while the sun continues to shine. In just a moment though we're going to be talking about rural risk and how to get the best out of it. And trauma insurance, first of all, what is it? Well trauma insurance is a, is a lump sum payment on specific diagnosis of a condition or a disability, uh, usually a significant illness. Um, it's a really, really good product to help alleviate the, the financial impact of, of a, a condition, a, a, an illness. Um, and it's not governed by any income, so you don't have to have an income. It's not like an income protection, uh, and you don't necessarily have to be to the extreme where you are permanently disabled or, or terminally ill. Uh, but it is, it is paid out specifically around diagnosis and around a more significant or serious condition. Barbara Lee, this is very different to terminal illness that you've spoken of in other times. That's right. This is a more immediate payment. This is like an everyday event, isn't mm -hmm. it? Cancer, heart attack, stroke, those types of uh, diagnosis. Um, so uh, a good comprehensive cover will cover you for about 43 plus conditions. Um, so it's giving good cover for those everyday events. Um, for a female, uh, you know, our biggest risk is cancer. Uh, so maybe a breast cancer diagnosis. Uh, and we have a three-step process to it where we have an early diagnosis payment, uh, full trauma payment, and then um, we've also got these uh, severe trauma payments. So little buckets of money that come in uh, as people mm, need them. Buckets of money are fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, it's really very different to what we've talked about with the terminal. So Hank, mm. This isn't, this is, you don't have to be terminally no, not diagnosed. At all. No, <coughs> not at all. The criteria is you still have to be alive after 14 days of diagnosis. <laughs> so, so that helps. Um, but it is specific around the diagnosis. So, so I'll give an example. Um, we know that from, from, from historical data that, that more than 80% of, of female claims on trauma are cancer related, one way yeah, or another. Hence what Barbara Lee was yeah, saying. Yeah, for males, more than 85% of, of trauma claims are cancer or heart related. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example around cancer. Uh, if you have a very small melanoma that we often get and, and, the, and the doctor just, just cuts it out there and then, that's not gonna warrant a, a, you know, a 50, 60, $100,000 claim. So, so you need to reach melanoma at a certain depth and certain severity before you get a claim. So th there are certain aspects that need to get to a stage before each of the various claims are made, like early cancer stage would be very early and it would be a, a smaller amount of, of, of capital sum that you get. Then you get a full trauma. There are now an option for what we call a severe trauma. Historically what's happened in the past is that trauma claims have become easier and easier to claim. Number one, because it's more competitive within the life companies. So they say, hey, you should use our trauma because actually we've lowered the standard and you could claim earlier. Yeah? The other aspect is, is medical technology has advanced. So we now know that tra we can now identify some illnesses or, or, or ailments at a much earlier stage and therefore mm -hmm. the trauma is paid a lot earlier. So the problem with that is more claims, more claims, more costs to the life insurance company. So what do they premiums do? Premiums go up. The premiums mm -hmm. up. Of course they do. So what we now have available is a, a trauma that's, that's paid on a 
far greater severity and therefore is cheaper because it's harder to claim. Okay. Barbara Lee, do you have to have life insurance coupled in with this? No, no, you don't. Not you at all. Used to you have can to. have it. Right. No, it can be a standalone product. Um, and it's really important too if you've got a current uh, trauma policy that you mm. get that reviewed mm. uh, because we have um, access to ratings for the different products. Um, for example, as Hank said, as a, a male, your biggest risk is cancer and heart. Well, you wouldn't want a like a C rating for a heart attack definition. Mm. You'd want to make sure that um, the definitions are going to meet the, the client's needs. So for females, really great ratings for cancer and for guys, cancer and heart attack. So somebody might be sitting there with an old policy um, that may not work so well at claim time. So we re re review, <laughs> I need, need, had trouble getting that out, but we'll review what, every two years? or? Yeah, still product review for clients. You know, if you've got an existing trauma policy, how does that stack up to what's on offer today? And the neat thing is you don't charge for these reviews. No, no. No, <laughs> <laughs> no we don't. <laughs> no, there's no fees for our services, which no. is great. No, it's good. Coming back to to the trauma, I've got stroke coming through my mind all the time too. I wonder, is, is stroke the sort of thing you're looking yep, at? absolutely. So a stroke is, is covered under trauma, but there needs to be a degree of severity or permanent disability within that stroke before a payment's made. So once again, you could have a mild stroke and it has no impact and no effect whatsoever. You feel a bit ill or something's gone wrong, you go to the doctor uh, and the doctor says you've had a mild stroke. No problem at all, we put you on, uh, on a medication to help control that and there's no financial impact and no disability. So but if it's severe and you've got one yeah. side of your face yeah. paralysed yeah. and you can't use your one yeah. arm. It's based on a percentage of permanent disability. So the first payment is made at 25% permanent disability on, on, on a normal standard sort of trauma. 25% of permanent, di di permanent disability and you would get a payment. Mm. This is totally, once again, totally different to your health insurance, not health insurance, sorry, the, you know, your sort of accident and illness. Yes, that's right. As Hank said, it's a lump sum product. It's just designed that when moments in life happen, um, that, you know, knock our socks off a bit, uh, we want to be able to have that ability to focus on getting better without any financial worries. So farming, you get a lump sum and you can hire somebody and you can sit in your lazy boy and say, have you cleaned out under the wall shed? Yeah, th there are better products for farmers. Yeah. Um, I think around that, around their business, I think there's much better ways of doing that. But where it's particularly good could be the farmer's wife who perhaps doesn't earn an income and yet requires to have some home help, uh, to have some, some, some care while the farmer's out milking cows doing what he does. So in that particular case, it, it might be more per pertinent to, for, the, for the wife or who's at yeah. home who does the accounts and that sort of thing uh, to have some tra some trauma cover that's a Just to time. take all that stress away yeah. yeah, because stress is the major thing and I mean you, you spend all day talking to people and your aim is to take the stress out of their eyes. Absolutely. Right? You know we're definitely there at claim time to help our clients through those times yep. and putting funds there you know it gives them choices. Yep. Um, you know they can have someone in to you know look after the home or the children. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, go to the hospital in a, in a taxi if they want. You know, it's things that make it easy for them. Everybody's different to what they want and need, but it's yeah. just making it easier. So, big package, you're basically looking at a range of products. Yeah, you are, and it depends on their yeah. circumstances. Exactly. Trauma is particularly good for financial assistance for people who aren't earning money, and that could be wives, that could be students, it could be. Uh, could be anybody could who's, be anybody. Could who's be not retired. taking out of their business. And yeah, children, correct. Hank. And children. And children. Yeah. You know, they're, they're a, um, they claim all the time for traumas. You know, what happens if a child has an event and uh, the rescue helicopter comes in and takes them to Starship? Uh, they're going to get looked after beautifully, but, you know, the parents have to fund uh, lost income and travel cost, accommodation cost. And, you know, this is where that money comes in for those times too. You can do that for children. Oh, yeah. yes. The whole family needs to be covered. That's so important. There's some quite good benefits uh, around uh, uh, trauma uh, that give free trauma for children. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there are some, some, some really good options out there. Yes. Well, thank you, because there's obviously you're going to be taking a lot of stress out of a lot of people's lives, and thank you very much indeed. Just a moment, we're going to be talking about resource management, and that's a concern. Resource Management Minister. Yes, yeah, in terms of uh, RMA, that's working its way through the Parliament. In terms of uh, natural resources, 
uh, we've got a real focus on uh, doing what we can to support regional water storage projects and we've had a couple of very good budgets there. We're very keen to see more water storage projects uh, get off the ground. Uh, Central Plains 2 is working its way through as we speak. We know that Central Plains 1 is taking a lot of pressure off the groundwater aquifers down there, which means some of that water flows into Lake Earlsmere, which is very important. Uh, we know that uh, water storage projects are good for not only uh, regional economic uh, activity, but also they're good for the environment as well because you can maintain those summer water flows. So we're waiting to see what happens with Ruatanifa. There are other very exciting water storage projects uh, in the, the development phase, particularly down where you are there on the east coast of the South Island and uh, other parts of New Zealand. So I'm hugely excited about water storage. I think when we're dealing with some of the issues that we are dealing with in terms of climate mitigation and changes, then storing water is going to be hugely important uh, for us as a nation going forward. That leads me straight on to the drought, which it looks as though it is going to be a three-year event. Um, certainly in North Canterbury, it's very, very tough, and I've been down there on a regular basis, and I'm amazed at how well those farmers are working together in their community to get through. It's very, very tough on there. There's just a little patch there around Cheviot and other areas on the east coast of the South Island. It just tends to be missing any decent rain. They've once again got a water storage project that's taken a while to get going. They're very focused on that now. We're doing what we can to support them through the Rural Support Trust. And I acknowledge all of those businesses that um, got involved and got a lot of their farmers up to the National Field Days. I met them up there. They had a whale of a time and it was a wonderful opportunity for them to get off farming and, and just realise that they're not dealing with some of their issues uh, on their own. It's often been said that PR is a very important part of farming and the farming industry, but the bottom line is we're not all that very good at it. I'd like to say that Federated Farmers are doing a good thing with little farm visits where on a specific day the people in the city can come out and have a wander around. It must be an osher's nightmare, but it's very good. And the people do come out and they do wander around and they do see cows and they do see crops. And the nice thing about that is that youngsters can actually learn that milk doesn't come in cartons, it actually comes from a cow through a processing plant and then into the cartons. And that the vegetables don't suddenly appear as if by magic in the green grossing section of a supermarket. The most important thing I think is to get the youngsters and get them an understanding so that they can relate properly to farming. It wasn't that many generations ago that everybody in the city seemed to have an uncle and an auntie who ran a farm. And so weekends and school holidays, they'd go out to the farm and they'd work out exactly what it all was about and they'd play in the hay stack and the hay shed and they'd, they'd feed pet lambs and they'd do all those sorts of things that second nature to country people. I'd like to now though congratulate New World because New World have come out with a scheme. There's been a fair bit of talk recently about school children and schools obviously starting to do a vegetable patch so that the youngsters can get their hands dirty and they can plant seeds and plant little plants and then of course they will mature and then they can eat the produce except normally the produce comes into eating stage during the school holidays which is a bit of a problem. However Getting back to the point, what New World have done is they've come out with little wee capsules and it's a little container and there's a compressed soil piece in the bottom of it and there's a little pad with some seeds in it. So the children can read the instructions or the parents can read the instructions and put a bit of water onto that little wee piece of soil and it expands out and they can look and see what's happening there and then they put it into the little container and then they put the seeds on top of that and they keep it watered and the instructions are when you get up in the morning see if it's moist and if you before you go to bed make sure there's enough moisture in there and then you'll be able to grow things once they've grown a wee bit the youngsters can then put them in a bigger pot and eventually they can proudly present them to the family isn't that absolutely brilliant that we've actually got a supermarket chain who are saying, let's work with the farming population, let's work with the people on the land and actually get an understanding for the youngsters who live in a city that things like vegetables don't suddenly appear 
they're grown. And isn't that half the fun? I tell you what, it's not just aimed at the youngsters either. I'm doing quite a few of them already. After the break, we're going to be talking to Joey Goodhue about forestation. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. news as far as forestation is concerned? So of course at the moment um, Paula Bennett is talking up our ratification of the Paris Agreement and a lot of people are talking about planting trees. The carbon price um, last week was at 18.20 and that's certainly giving elevating confidence I think we could say. The afforestation grant scheme which is a government scheme started last year but the first plantings are happening now and in the first year of planting there'll be five million trees planted. So a variety of varieties being planted, uh, most of them or they all should be happening in erosion prone areas and then there'll be the second round underway very shortly because we've had um, a great number of applications for funding in the second round. And it's an ongoing project? It's a five year program, $22.5 million and it's it's come at a time where, um, as I say, people are worried about not enough trees being planted. It's a great way to sequester carbon of course and the government's um, pleased to encourage it. In just a moment or two we're going to be talking about irrigation systems which are basically cash and carry. Phil, you've repackaged the three and five K-line packs. Why? Uh, look, it's all about providing people what they require for the areas that they've actually got to hand. Um, when you have a look at a lot of lifestyle areas, they're relatively small paddocks. So we're trying to give people the opportunity just to pick up a single pack and actually have their uh, requirements satisfied. There were some people who were sort of suggesting that the one hectare one didn't actually get into all the corners, but you fixed that. Uh, yeah, that's all about the hard decisions you have to make. Um, what we've done with the, with the bigger package is that we've increased the amount of pipe that's on there, um, and that's about making sure that, in fact, we've got enough such that we can do exactly what we've suggested. Uh, the other pack still does roughly a hectare. Um, just that this package, you can just pick up one item and off you go. Uh, and it fits much better into a DIY type of um, opportunity, I guess. So really the only decision is whether you need a three or a five pack? The decision is whether you have a three or a five. And the three is going to fit really well in, I can imagine, a horse field or um, a situation where you have a smaller paddock and you're actually trying to um, just cover that well enough. Um, it comes with a number of nozzles, as in fact do all of the uh, farm packs. Um, they have three different nozzles in there, so you can adjust application rate and depth. Um, and they have a, a reasonably high performance non-sprinkler in them. DIY, how simple is it to get the whole thing up and running? 
Well, basically anybody that can um, screw a thread together or drill a hole actually has the ability to do the job. And there's stuff that we've got in there that assists people along that process. Uh, we've got a manual that covers uh, all of the what's in the pack, obviously, and exactly the detail that you need to put a whole system together. Now, some people don't like reading instruction manuals, but they'll watch a DVD. Uh, the reality is, actually, it also comes with the DVD. So the DVD talks about the basics that you need to know and the process one, one to ten of how you would actually put all of that together. So what do you actually get when you buy the pack? You get, uh, whether it's a three or a five, obviously the appropriate number of pods to go with that. Uh, you also get, in the three pod circumstance, you get 66 metres of um, K-pipe. Now the K-pipe is specially made for K-line. Uh, and the compromise um, there, or the requirement for that and specification is something that is uh, flexible, uh, yet tough enough to actually take the rigours of being shifted. Because in a, an irrigation sense, many, many systems, actually the product's static. It's not shifted, it's not moved. K-Line really does test the rigour of, of materials in some regard. Uh, we've also, in K-Pipe, put a, a clear stripe along the top uh, and often people will actually align that to the top of the pipe just to make sure that there are no twists actually in the pipeline. Because if it twists and you start moving it, the pods will tend to roll over. So we're trying to avoid that. So we want them all uh, above. Um, and then in the five pack, effectively you get the same sort of arrangement, only more. So rather than 66 metres, we've got 116 metres. Uh, or in the standard farm pack, 100 metres. And you've even got the right size drill bit. There's a drill bit in there uh, with a collar to actually stop you drilling right through the pipe, which um, clearly can be done and actually has been done, so we've tried to protect that. Um, it comes with a socket in there to do the um, uh, nuts up on the saddles. Um, the uh, nuts, in this case, are brass nuts screwing onto stainless steel, which means they don't gall, they don't lock, they, they actually smoothly screw down. Um, and uh, also a, a drill bit connector for uh, those things, just to make it easy. So basically, Phil, it's a cash and carry? It's, a, it's pretty much a cash and carry. So you would pick, pick up the uh, roll, um, take it out into your paddock and actually start installing it. And it's complete. Um, although I would recommend to watch the really good DVD at the start. Just to give you that final instruction. That's correct. After the break, we're going to be talking to Barry Johns about life after being a vineyard owner. We are living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world.
Barry, how did you get involved as a vineyard owner? Well, essentially from being a, a keen wine consumer and uh, uh, belonging to the Cellar Masters Wine Club here in Christchurch back in the 1980s. And um, uh, I, you know, I really was interested in gaining you know, more knowledge about wine and appreciation of it. And uh, that led to me in 1989 uh, taking a sabbatical from the law practice that I was in at the time and um, spending six weeks on the road in France uh, on a solo cycle journey through the, the main wine regions and um, uh, just getting a feel for what, what happens on the land and uh, tasting some pretty good wines along the way and just ex expanding my knowledge and uh, uh, appreciation of the industry. Now you wrote a book about that. Yes, I've written an e-book, uh, A Wine Lover's Tour de France, based on that journey of two and a half thousand kilometres in six weeks. So I was doing a lot of cycling and uh, tasting wines along the way as well. And that's, that's been published on uh, Amazon.com and uh, I'm getting good sales for it. And then of course you ended up owning and developing Fiddler's Green. Yeah, that was... Uh, in 1994, we um, uh, bought a bare land block of 50 acres at Wipera on George's Road and um, commenced to develop that and uh, create uh, a new wine brand, Fiddler's Green. So that was a family business involving Jenny, my wife, and also our eldest son, Ben, uh, who had done a postgraduate um, course at Lincoln in viticulture. Damn hard work though, isn't it? It, it is demanding work. Um, uh, there was a lot of um, initial sort of uh, thought that this was going to be a wonderful uh, <laughs> venture um, and uh, we had the passion for it, uh, but uh, it was a huge amount of work and a huge amount of capital required to sustain it. And in the end we were under-resourced in, in both capital and manpower, yeah. And it sort of basically ended up with you having health problems. Yeah, well, we, uh, in, uh, we had the um, situation where from about 2007 onwards that uh, we were starting to feel, feel the pressure in the business due to too much debt that we'd built up. And, um, then, um, but we, we, we struggled on and uh, by, by 2011, of course, when the big earthquake struck in February, um, that was, was a real blow for us because um, we lost something like 40% of our customer base in the city when, it was, when the CBD was all shut down. So um, you know, we used to supply a whole range of um, uh, restaurants, cafes, wine bars, hotels with our wines and um, some of those have never re-established. Um, some of them are back now but uh, that was a real blow for us financially and um, and then within two or three weeks of that uh, I had a heart episode and had to be admitted to hospital and um, have uh, stents implanted. And I'd only been home a couple of days and Jenny had a heart episode that saw her in hospital for five days. Um, but we recovered from all that and, uh, and we were motivated to really try and um, uh, sell the vineyard and move on. Now Glasnevin has to be a big feather in your cap. Yeah, well, Glasnevin is a, um, another brand which was set up um, really around about 2005 and uh, it was always meant intended to be Ben's brand, Ben's uh, business and it is. He owns it and I'm now working for him as his general manager on a part-time basis and uh, for which he pays me a small wage but <laughs> that's okay. Um, and. Uh, that was always focused on um, a limited range of wines. Uh, we only do four wines under the Glass Never label. <coughs> Three aromatic whites and a Pinot Noir. 
and limited production, but they are top-end wines in terms of quality and, um, and well-priced. They're, they're well-priced uh, value-for-money wines, but they are towards the top end. So they're only of a limited availability, and we, we're focused on selling those wines to um, selected retail and fine wine dining restaurants, etc. We're not in the supermarkets. It's just a, a nice niche brand which I'm very happy working with. And you've got a very special line of Glasnevin Pinot Noir that you were very involved with. In 2012, uh, uh, we, we started talking about that, didn't we? Uh, we uh, I made a decision that we'd do a special wine under the Glasnevin label, just to give some focus to the brand. And uh, the fruit came off the Fiddler's Green Vineyard. But it was all hand-picked and selected. Um, we only did 500 kg of fruit, but very carefully hand-selected and picked, and handy stemmed and processed. And I, I was involved in it all the way through, working with the winemakers at um, Pegasus Bay, using their facilities. And I only did, in the end, just a single barrel. Uh, 275 bottles were finally uh, produced. And each bottle was numbered, one to two seven five, uh, on on the label. And uh, it, I and having kept a full diary of the whole process, I felt it would be a really good marketing strategy to produce a book which told the story of this the making of this particular wine. And uh, so that's what I did. And uh, uh, I had that. Um, I wrote it, I had that all um, um, edit, professionally edited and uh, proofread and then I had it um, through our graphics man, we had it formatted and uh, printed. And um, that book goes with, with each bottle of wine, that wine that we sell, in a black presentation box and uh, it's quite a unique offering. And there's still some left? There's still some left, yeah. Uh, you've ended up writing about your your winery dog or your vine your vineyard dog? Yes, that's um, the the whole business of keeping a diary and, and getting involved in writing and, and really enjoying that process with the 2012 Pinot Noir has stimulated stimulated my my interest in writing. Uh, I read a lot anyway, and I've, uh, having been a former lawyer, um, I've always had a fascination with words and the English language. So. Um, uh, I'm really enjoying writing, and now I'm about to publish a, um, a short book uh, that I've produced and written about our dog, Jem, uh, who was with us from... Uh, she came to us when she was three, and um, she died at 13, so we had her for 10 years. And she was an amazing dog, very special crossbred, crossbreed dog with a wonderful temperament and um, so we, the three of us, Ben included, really uh, still talk about Jem often. You know, she's, she left her mark on us and um, so I've, I've enjoyed writing about her and, um, and with my recent interest in, uh, in art um, I have done a painting which will be, form the, a full colour cover for the book and I've done uh, three black and white sketches which will be spread throughout the, uh, the text and um, I'm hoping to get that book out to, to the market within the next month. So, vineyards, writing, and now you're doing painting. How did you get into painting? Well, um, uh, I guess it's uh, having time to do, to, um, to do other things. I, um, now that I'm semi-retired, the work I do with, for Ben with the Glass Nevin brand is 25 hours a week on average. That gives me time to um, also spend time writing, uh, which I do with the computer and producing Word documents, etc. Uh, but also, I, I've always had an eye for um, good design and form. I've had a feel for uh, um, artistic things. Uh, when I was living in Wellington as a young man, I, 
I even thought about doing architecture as a career, but never, never pursued it. Decided to come to Christchurch and do a law degree instead. But um, the, uh, the thing is that I had the time, and someone said to me, "Well, look, um, you can uh, do. Uh, you can. There are art classes at Art Metro, at the top end of Papanui Road here, where." Um, it's not too expensive and they, they have nine week terms uh, where you go along once a week for two hours and they have very good tutors and um, you, you can learn learn how to paint. And I thought, well, I'm prepared to have, have a look at that. So uh, I did that, that was uh, in June of 2015. So 15 months on, I'm now, I've now produced probably upwards of 50 50 works. And you are going to sell some? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I need to because um, uh, we're becoming a bit cluttered here. But uh, I've gone from being a complete novice to now, in, in the words of my tutor, um, producing some very good work. And I have got a wonderful tutor, Olivia, who is wonderful with colour and she's uh, very supportive and encouraging and she encourages me to develop my own style and um and i just uh, it's um I, I just i love it so your advice to somebody your age is probably just don't lie down oh yeah there's, there's so many opportunities for to do things try new things challenge yourself be active um yeah um don't stand still a very interesting retirement that he's having. Just a moment or two, we're going to be going out to Ashley Dean and seeing what Lincoln University are doing dairying wise. Ashley Dean taking a whole new look at itself. It has. Um, we're here at the Ashley Dean Research and Development Station on, on the dairy part. Um, this was previously the Ashley Dean Dryland Farm uh, for more than a century. And over the past um, three years, about uh, 200 hectares of land has been developed into an, an irrigated dairy uh, block with some irrigated sheep as well. It's right up there as far as processes are concerned. It is. Um, what we've developed on the dairy part here is a, a facility, facility to support farm systems dairy research. Um, exploring options and solutions for dairy farmers to uh, drive profitability and improved environmental outcomes. You're looking at feed systems as well as other things? We have. We are looking at all those things. So the facilities that we've developed here, are, um, we've got a milking shed, we've got um, standoff pad facilities, uh, which have uh, various materials within them, and feeding facilities where cows come off and off, on and off the paddock. Uh, for short periods of time, uh, in line with them increasing their productivity as well as improving their environmental footprint. Tell me about the standoff pads because they've got different surfaces. Um, so what we have is we have a, a range of standoff pad facilities and it's particularly directed towards uh, winter feeding systems where some of our environmental losses of nitrogen are particularly large and exploring options to get cows off paddocks for short periods of time. So. Uh, what we have is we have standoff pads uh, with uh, wood chip in them, we have some with um, some gravel and, uh, and experimenting with different sizes of gravel and we also have some with um, a geotextile carpet on top of it. And we've been looking at over this past winter exploring options uh, for cows coming off the paddock, feeding, uh, had fodder bed in the paddock coming off uh, essentially over the night time period. Uh, and looking at their lying and standing times and the behaviour on these standoff pad facilities. This is very scientific, as though, isn't it? It is. Uh, in contrast to the other farms that Lincoln University has back at, uh, right by the campus of Lincoln University on the very good soils, uh, this is on a very light stony soil um, with low water holding capacity, which prevents, uh, presents challenges around uh, growing feed, uh, your pasture production, and challenges around your environmental losses because they're very prone to drainage of nitrogen, uh, of nitrate to soil water. So it is a significant challenge here to provide solutions for farmers within that context. You've got laboratories? We have, um, we've established uh, some um, pretty basic laboratory facilities here for um, 
for staff from Link University and their collaborative partners to work in, includes wet and dry labs, includes seminar rooms for bringing um, for bringing outside organisations in to, to discuss the results from our research and for that technological transfer aspects. Would it pay for itself? The, uh, the development here is, is, is focused on farm systems research and so in terms of paying for itself, um, we have a dairy farm so we receive money from our, our milk sales uh, but a real priority of us at the university is driving uh, collaborative research programs. So Link University does receive income from those research programs, but what is really important is that uh, we actually provide solutions uh, for our farmers around productivity, profit and environmental performance. You're really a very much a key player when it comes to dairying on light land. Look, yeah, I think we're a key player not only for the dairy conversions which, uh, which may be uh, come up in the future, but we're also a key player for providing solutions for uh, those farmers that are facing environmental challenges under the, cu the current um, nutrient limits. So through time many farmers will be asked to reduce uh, nitrate leaching in line with uh, regional council policies and uh, we hope to be at the forefront in providing leadership for those solutions. Well I guess you're leading from the front. Leading from the front, it's uh, very much where Link University in conjunction with its collaborative partners, particularly associated with the, the Lincoln Hub, um, uh, which is um, developing to a large extent, um, providing a resource for those partners to come here and work uh, on this farm from a research and uh, farm systems point of view. And after the break, we're going to be talking to the Minister about dairying. Everybody has a story to tell. What's yours? Maybe your family has been farming the land for five generations. Perhaps you have invented the next best thing in agriculture, or maybe something else. Whatever your story, if you're out on the land, we want to hear from you. Get in touch by emailing us at info at ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. Talking about dairying, there's a bit of positivity now. Yes, there is. Um, of course, we've seen the last couple of global dairy, dairy trade auctions have increased quite significantly on the last one. And then uh, Fonterra just in the last week or so indicating that uh, their forecasting is up 50 cents, which is, you know, that's put a lot of smiles on the dials, a bit of spring in the step when our farmers out there are doing their hard yards in the middle of uh, carving as we speak. What's really interesting is uh, it's taken a while for uh, all of these things to sort of align and that's you know, when I talk about that I mean uh, the global sort of dairy volatility is lines up with about three or four things. One is you've got the European unions, that, European countries producing more milk. You've got uh, a ban of products that used to come from the European Union into Russia. That meant that some of that product was coming into some of our more historical markets. The China inventory has taken a while to work its way through and also oil producing countries have got less buying power, buying power, although that's starting to be corrected right now. So having all those things align is very unusual. But what's happened in the last wee while is that our demand is still being 
growing around the world at 2 to 3%. New Zealand's supply was back about 3% for the last 12 months, indicating to be back another 3% uh, for this season. And now, so that means it wouldn't take much for the price to start coming up when you see the, the growth demand figures. So less milk coming out of the European Union as well, which is a positive uh, for New Zealand farmers. So, you know, they're about a 156 billion litre market. And if they, re- we're about 20 billion, if they reduce just a little bit, uh, that's significant for uh, global supply. The other fundamental point that I want to acknowledge on your show, Rob, is that you know, farmers have done incredibly well to rein in their cost structures. Just a few seasons ago, the cost was about $5.75 a kilogram of milk solids. It's now down to just a whisker over $5. So farmers have tightened their belt. They're focused on their line-by-line cash flow analysis. They work very closely with their professional advisors, their banks and accountants to make sure that you know, ultimately they're growing as much grass and harvesting it and, and making sure that they're running a very efficient and profitable business. And you know, by and large, uh, most dairy farmers will come through this period having a more resilient business model going forward, which I think is absolutely fantastic. But we shouldn't, um, I guess, look through this with too many rose-tinted glasses because uh, for a few of our farmers it's been very, very tough. Hank, looking at small businesses and farms, for example, how does the insurance work and who gets what? Yeah, very interesting. We have a huge number of small businesses in New Zealand. In fact, we have more registered small companies um, per head of population than anywhere else in the Western world. And the rural sector is no exception to that. Uh, It's evolved over a period of time. Once upon a time, it was a farm. It was done as a partnership and, 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 you know, the, the farmer milk cows and... But now we have so many support uh, farm workers. So your dairy farmer now has a, a milking contractor, possibly, or a shear milker, a lower order, or a, or a 50-50 shear milker. Then they have agricultural contractors that come in and they, 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 they bale the hay and they mend the fences. So the whole sector is made up of small businesses, one or two man bands. Um, and they work a little bit differently in how they get their money. So we often talk about income protection. How do we how do we replace our income if we're unable to work? Uh, and we have ACC, which generally for most employed people works yeah, well. But you're getting eighty percent of no no drawings because correct you're not taking any drawings necessarily. Yeah, absolutely, that's right. And that's where that's where ACC doesn't work. And we need to have something that focuses on on the business. So what we need to do is we need to look at the business as a separate financial entity and and what would cause a financial suffering to the business if something was to occur. We we, we insure our tractors and our, our, our all our equipment so that if that doesn't work, if that has an accident, doesn't work, it's we, we can get it fixed. However, that tractor doesn't work without somebody actually sitting behind the steering wheel and driving it. So let me show you. I'm going to draw a picture. Please which, do. That's why we've got this. That's why we've got this here. I'll show you how, in in very very simple terms, and and it's it's nice and simple terms because I understand it. And this is how I get it. So hope, hopefully, uh, other people I'll get, get it. it as well. So first of all, I'm going to draw what is essentially a bucket. I call it the money bucket. Uh, this is essentially your business bank account. Money comes into that bucket because you perform a function. So let's say, Rob, for example, you're a contract milker. Really, really simple. So money comes into that bucket because you milk cows. Yep. Yeah, that's the, that's the fundamental. Or make silage or whatever it might be. Doesn't matter. Let's fundamentally just talk about milking cows because that's easy. That's a primarily where most of your money is going to come in. And it sits in the bottom of this money bucket, your business bank account. Yeah. And that happens because of you. Yep. So money comes out of that bucket. Yeah. And that's, first of all, your drawings. That's, that's what you live on. That pays the groceries, gets you a an ale on a Friday night, um, that's, that's, that's your money. Also comes out of that could be wages, you may employ some staff, and a whole bunch of other expenses, petrol for your, for your, for your farm bike, all the other stuff that comes into it, and it pays all. And your insurances. Insurances and your ACC levies, all that sort of stuff. So, money coming in here, good. Money coming in here, good. Everything's fine until something happens to you by way of your health. It could be accident or illness, doesn't matter. All of a sudden, you're out of the picture. If you're out of the picture, 
ultimately this will stop because you drive that. You may have a couple of people working for you and they can continue to work, but you are responsible and you are key to this function occurring. This function can't occur, this stops. This comes down here, that stops. That stops, that stops, that stops, that stops. So what we need is we need this to continue. How do we do that? We need another Rob. There is only one of me, <laughs> but I know what you mean. We need someone else to perform this particular function. It doesn't have to be one person. It could be a consultant that comes in from time to time. It could be one of the employees who's asked to step up and take that responsibility, but that's going to be a cost. That has to come out of here because the other Rob isn't going to do it for free. No. So that comes out of this bucket. It's money that you haven't accounted for, money that's extra, that's not in your budget, it's not in your business plan. So we need some money coming into here. Yeah? That is what we call insurance. Insurance is simply the funding mechanism to be able to provide for this so that this can continue and therefore these things here can all continue. So that money doesn't come to me as Rob, no. it goes to the business as in yeah. Rob's country. Because where is it needed? It's needed in the business. So where should it go? Into the business, not to Rob. If this goes to Rob, it's income. It's directed to Rob. Yeah. If he needs to boost this bucket up, he has to put the money in. But when it comes into him, it's income. It's taxed. It's income tax because it's classed as income. If it comes in here, it's taxed, but only at the P&L level. And theoretically, the money comes in here should be the same as that goes out here. So it doesn't affect the profit. It doesn't affect the loss. There's no loss. There's no profit. It balances out. Does that make sense? So it this, does. it's just really figuring out the amount that needs to go in there. So who should own that policy? Well, to me, it would be me, but I bet I'm wrong. No, it's the business. <laughs> yes. Because the business is a financial entity in its own right. It can own its own policies and should. And there are tax advantages. Now, I'm not, a t I'm not an accountant uh, and you need to, uh, you know, business people need to talk to their accountant. But there are definitive and clear tax advantages in, in, in having that owned by the business. And there are, of course, uh, practicalities around that money going into the business. If you were taken out of the picture, you had a bad accident, you were in, in, in intensive care, uh, you're in a coma and that money comes to you, there might be issues about the, that money, when that money is available. Coming in here, it's in the business. So the even business a broken bank. leg can, can put me up on the couch? That's right. Absolutely that's right. And now we need to talk to people on, an, on a case by case basis to see what's appropriate. But the other aspect of this is because it's going in here, it's not offset by any ACC entitlement. Because ACC is paid to you and is taxed before you get it. And we've talked about that before. Okay, so the insurance up above here, that's actually paid for by my company. Correct, by your business. By my yep. business. Yep. Now you own the business, so indirectly it is you that's paying it because at the end of the day it's your business or it might be yours and a business partner. It might be uh, your wife or your spouse or whoever it might be. However, this is your business, the money needs to go in here because the money needs to come out of there in order to replace you as and, key to the business. And some insured? I mean, how, how do we work out the sum insured? Well, that varies. That varies from operation to operation, from, from, from um, business to business, depending on what the business is. We're a country where we have so many small businesses, they are often tradespeople who happen to be in business. Yep. Because that's the way they get their remuneration, that's how they make their money, that's how they pay their bills. Yeah, so it will vary from, from, from operation to operation. A bigger operation, it might require much greater expertise to be, able to, to be able to perform that function. So it really is one that's, that's individual, and that's where we come in. And we look at, look at the business and we discuss with the business owner or owners, as the case may be, and say, OK, well, what, what's likely to happen if this scenario occurs? How, what's the financial impact? What's going to cost you to create another role? And it might not be one particular um, person. It doesn't have to be one entity. It could be a number of entities. It could be a consultant that comes in every week to talk to the staff about what they need to do for that particular time. Hank, thank you very much indeed. Now listen, if you'd like to 
go over that with Hank again, you can go to our website, which is ontheland.co.nz. I'm Rob Cope Williams. You've either been watching or you've just missed a very good explanation about why you should have insurance. I will be back at the same time next week, though. Until then, bye.